just comparing the uh, just the perchlorate part of that structure that I showed you, it's probably the most dramatic change because it, it's of its sort of almost spherical size and it vibrates a lot. So you can see that at very low temperature, the neutron and the X-ray values for the CLO distance agree really well, but there's much less variation in the neutron distances over temperature. And, but for X-ray, it changes quite a bit with temperature. You might think that distances get shorter when you cool. Sort of, you think about things shrinking when you cool them, but in fact, it's because of the thermal motion um, the distances are actually longer at low temperature and more accurate. I think maybe, maybe if you think about it this way. So it's, it's like vibrating like this, sort of. And um, the average distance is going to be like here, it's because you're looking at the average distance. It's vibrating like this. But then at low temperature, it's just it's this distance, which is longer, because it's not vibrating anymore. Anyway, um, so let's go on to part two of structure solution. And I left you with this in interesting message from my student, Michelle, who um, has, she has this boring molecule, and so she thought it would be the same as the published ones, where there would be a threefold axis. And so she was looking at space groups with threefold axes, R3 or P63 over M. Neither one of those, though, agreed with what she came up with, which was an orthorhombic cell. Those aren't orthorhombic, they're trigonal and hexagonal uh, space groups. But the data was good. And what I discovered, and I'll, I'll show you a little more about this, was that one of the angles was actually very close to 90 degrees. And so she had selected the suggested crystal system of orthorhombic, which was suggested by the data collection package. And from then on, she was stuck, because once you say it's orthorhombic, you can't really go back to monoclinic very well. But actually, one of those angles was just close to 90 degrees. It wasn't truly exactly 90 degrees. So I'm going to show you what I did when I looked at her data, and I could see right away what the problem was. OK. So um, here's X-PREP with her uh, orthorhombic cell. So the uh, orthorhombic A, B, and C, you always organize them, most always organize them smallest to largest. So it went 6, 14, 17. 1990-90, exactly. You can see the mean intensity over sigma. Um, this is what I like to look at, this, this, this row here. Very good, much more than six, so it's strong data. Uh, P lattice and uh, orthorhombic, blah, blah, blah. Then what happened was systematic absence exceptions, the usual list, and then the, see at the bottom there, bad. No acceptable space group. Change tolerances or unset chiral flag or possibly change input lattice type, then recheck cell using H option. H option is the one that determines the um, alternative settings. Okay, but in this case, because she's, she put it in as orthorhombic, it really didn't, it wasn't able to switch to monoclinic. So, Looking at this, though, I want you to notice um, these extinctions right here. That it says C glide, but it's in the A position in, this, in the space group, right? And then here's a screw axis that's also in the A position. Now, if it's if it's monoclinic, P21 over C, those should both be in the B position. Remember, because it's the B axis that's unique in monoclinic. So it looked, I just looked at it quickly. It looks like P21 over C, except she has A and B interchanged. So what do you do then? Um, you apply a matrix to transform it. 
and it all, it's a very simple matrix in this case. Oh, I didn't have to go over there. Just, it's, this is a the three by three matrix, but it's written out as nine, nine characters, right? So it's zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, and then a zero, zero, minus one. Usually you, if you switch two axes, you have to change one sign, so you preserve the right-handed coordinate system. So I just did that, transformation matrix, and then the interchange A and B, 14, 6, 17. Now, this angle is no longer exactly 90, but it's probably within 1% of 90. However, as you go down to the, um, the um, selecting of the space group, it's selected it easily as, as P to 1 over C. I see I cut out the wrong thing there. I was trying to get it to fit on the page. Here it is. This should have come first, but here's, you see the 2, 1 is along B, and the C glide is along B also, so P to 1 over C is clear, perfectly clear. So then, it sets up this file. The main thing I wanted you to notice here is that this is now copper radiation. She used copper radiation because it was all light atoms. So this, uh, just the wavelength is 1.54178 angstroms. It's about double what molybdenum wavelength is. And, you know, here's symmetry operation, SVAC, just carbon, hydrogen, and boron. That was all she expected. And I, I put in the size. That's you know, something you have to add yourself. And then it's set up to do TREF, direct methods. Actually, I tried direct methods and it didn't work. So then I tried XT and it didn't work. And the reason XT didn't work was that it was looking for an orthorhombic space group because these are all exactly 90. So um, I just changed that to 91 just arbitrarily. But I don't know what it really is until you go back, start at the very beginning again, select a monoclinic setting for the crystal system and you know, determine the unit cell with some accuracy and then you'll get something different from 90. And I don't really know what that is because I just passed it back to her at this point. But um, probably not more than 91. It's not more than one degree different from 90, usually when you see this. Okay, so what happens then? Oh. Then I wanted to show you the uh, solution, just quickly here. So I'm going to the command prompt and going to Michelle. So you don't have to type the whole name in, just two characters is all you really need to go to the directory unless it's redundant with something else. But if it's unique, uh, just a couple of characters like MI would go to Michelle. So I said CD, Mish, I just typed it really fast. And then to see what's in there, say directory, and the um, setup file mf.ins and mf.hkl, that's all I need to solve it. So if I run xt, I just say from the command prompt xt space mf, simple. And it says that it considered eight centrosymmetric and six non-centrosymmetric space groups. Didn't like any of them. So <clears throat> only one of them is suggested, which is P21 over C. And I'll just show you quickly what it looks like. Oh, one other thing. So people who aren't here are missing out on this. Do you use stereo glasses at all? I brought some for you. <laughs> so let's see, we could pass out, say, divide them into maybe four rows or something. Why don't you start over there and I'll start over here. Okay, take a bunch. <laughs> so any leftover, just bring them back to me. Here, pass this back. Now you want to fold them so they fit your head, you know, and the red should be on the left. Make sure the red is on the left. <laughs> yeah, right.
Yeah, make sure the red is on the left, like so. Oh, you look good. <laughs> we should have a picture of this. <laughs> So this is the cheap way to see three dimensions. These are like 25 cents a piece, these glasses. Thanks. Yeah. This, is, this is called anaglyph. Have you heard of that word, anaglyph? No, OK, I'll write it. And the, if you go on the web and ask for images that are anaglyph, then you can see, oh, you know, national parks and things. They look really cool. Now, if you're a man, you may have trouble seeing reds. Some men do. I don't think women have that problem. <laughs> so then it doesn't work, sorry. <laughs> OK, so let's see how this looks. This looks like it just solved the structure outright. So I'm just going to go to XP. So this is the molecular geometry program. And then type the name of um, the output file, which is it's, it's actually MF underline A, first choice. And it always selects the res file, the res file, unless you tell it otherwise. Then you have to say FMO, which is basically looking at covalent radii and making bonds. And then proj. And OK, here's the structure. Um, <laughs> So that's, a, that's actually a boron in the middle. That's, it's not showing. So how do we get out of that? Let's see. Maybe I just have to close it. Hold on. <clears throat> now you can see it, right? Make it bigger. Wait, sorry. I had minimized it. Excuse me. Okay, <laughs> Try that again. No? Okay, so this is not too uh, beautiful, but you can see that it's a it's actually a tri tris uh, cyclohexyl boron compound. There's a boron in the middle. One thing uh, XT doesn't always do is to identify the atom type correctly. So I'm not in stereo yet. I have to say stereo. Now look. See? You can see it really well, right? <laughs> Does it work? Do different directions. Okay. Yeah, maybe that would help too. Do you know how to turn off the lights? better. <laughs> and if you want to just continue in stereo, you can just say eyes, two, so two eyes. And like you can do um, packing and see it pretty well too. This isn't a very big unit cell, so I want to see, I'll look down the B axis. and find a smaller box. So now, you know, it's, it's actually pretty, pretty useful. Let's see. Yeah. 
I mean, sometimes it's easier to see it this way than without the stereo. I find it's useful. Do a different direction. Helps. Well, anyway, you can clearly see that this molecule lacks a threefold axis. That I wouldn't really expect the cyclohexyl groups to all have the same conformation, so they don't. Um, this is fairly planar, but it does, doesn't have a threefold axis. Okay. So you can hold on to those, maybe um, bring them to class again if we do some more of this. That would be good. They're my gift to you, anyway. <laughs> Um, okay, let's go back to them. Um, oh, I know what I wanted to do, though. Yeah, so that was just showing you XT. So XT has now solved the structure, but it doesn't take you any further than that. It, you have to go to a different program. So I would probably use XP to label the atoms, then write a, n a new INS file and then refine that and you know, maybe add hydrogens, make everything anisotropic, and it comes out quite nice. It's a good structure. Let's see. If I want to see what else is, what is in the directory, I can just say, uh, let's see, I'm out of this, yeah, directory. I'll show you one other cool one. You can use the glasses for this too. Um, So that, you don't know what that is, because there are symmetry operations that are going to generate a larger molecule. But remember I told you sometimes you can grow a crystal from the melt? So this was weird. I had, uh, there was a student who was totally surprised, and, and I was too. He had a triphenyl antimony, which melts at a pretty low temperature, actually. Mixed it with C60, and he thought, well, he thought there would be a reaction, but there wasn't actually a reaction, but I did get a crystal out. There was a, a lot of white crystals, which were just triphenyl antimony, but there were some black crystals in there, and I picked one out. And what do you know? In this program, if you just say grow, it, it uh, considers the symmetry, and then that's what it looks like, in fact. This is another case of uh, phenyl chelation because these phenyl rings on the anemone are kind of lying next to the C60 and there's a, a delocalization interaction, pi pi interaction type of thing. So again, um, I can do eyes too. Ac. I have to wait for it to put all the labels on. This one problem that it, it takes a long time sometimes to do that. Actually, this would be clear if I didn't have the hydrogens. Once you start to rotate it, the labels go away and then it's clear. <laughs> I want to get rid of the hydrogen, so I'm going to see a proj cell less dollar sign H. So this actually was a trigonal space group, so there is a threefold axis. The same reaction doesn't occur with triphenylphosphine. We tried that, tried triphenyl arsine, that didn't work. Triphenyl antimony, for some reason, it does. Let's just do this. And it's, it's 
speed it up and slow it down. Anyway, you get the idea. Did you see it with the glasses? Good, okay. Now, I, I, like I was saying, I find this program XP to be extremely flexible. You can also use it to make graphics, um, lots of things. It takes a little while to get used to it, but if you want to know what the commands are, just say help, <laughs> not help, but help. <laughs> and those are the commands. And they're, they're all four character words. Sheldrick likes four character words. They, um, most of them are kind of intuitive. And you don't actually need all of them all the time. I have a handout which I could give you which summarizes the simplest ones that you would probably want to use. And if you use a program like um, OLX2, I think it has XP embedded in it, and so it's going to have many of these same commands. OK. Enough of that. Let's go back to this. OK. So Michelle got a nice structure after all. It really was just a confirmation that she'd made what she thought, but um, I liked it anyway. So she just had to interchange A and B, change it to back to monoclinic. And because monoclinic has a lower Lowy symmetry than orthorhombic, she had to re-reduce the data, reintegrate the data, because it had merged the data assuming that it was orthorhombic. Orthorhombic's just one-eighth of the reflecting sphere, monoclinic's one-fourth. So to have all the data, she had to go back and start again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good idea. <laughs> but actually, we don't need, yeah, that's OK. That's good like that. OK, a little bit more math. Not a lot, just a little bit more math. So, so far we've been talking basically about um, the structure factor and the observed structure factor. Those are uh, not the electron density, which is what we like to think about when we think about uh, detecting where the atoms are in a structure. We want to look at the electron density. So there's a new equation here, the uh, electron density based on x, y, z, if you plot, if you have a plot of x, y, and z as your axes, is 1 over v times the sum of all the f obs times e to the minus i, 2 pi. And then here's the kicker, hx plus ky plus lz. So you, you cannot calculate the electron density full screen. Yes, good idea. You can't calculate the um, electron density. I'm sorry, what I need to do is do this. Yeah. You can't calculate the electron density unless you know. You can get this number, you can get the h, k, and l, but you, you need to know x, y, and z. So until you have at least one atom and you know the x, y, z position for that atom, you can't see any electron density. As you, so if you can have an atom that's strongly diffracting, like one with a lot of electrons, a heavy atom. You can get started and calculate the electron density, and then you can use a difference map, what we call difference map, to see the remainder of the electron density. So a difference, a delta F instead of F, is just FL obs minus F calc. And F calc is going to be really far off at that point, but you still get a value that allows you to calculate that. And um, we don't really, when we have a program like XT, it just finds everything all at once and you don't really need to worry about it. But there was a time when uh, the Patterson method was the only way to solve a structure. You had to have a heavy atom, you had to use the Patterson method to even get started. And that was in about 1935 that that was developed. Before that, it was really just guesswork. And then in about 1950, some direct methods programs were developed, and those are only for light atoms. Those are only for centrosymmetric structures. But the folks who did that got a Nobel Prize. Um, 
its names I can't remember right now, but anyway, it was, it was a big advance. People who were interested in, um, like, okay, here I said the same thing. Uh, macromolecular crystallography protein structures. For many, many years, the way to do that was to take the um, amino acids that have sulfur in them and convert the sulfur to selenium and then make the protein and then hope that the selenium would help get started on solving the structure. But it was pretty crude. It really didn't work so well. Um, they don't do that so much anymore, but it was useful at the time. So here's just an example of an electron density map. This was one where I actually had already solved the structure, but the remaining electron density is showing up. And it's, it's, it was also done at low temp. I think it was helium structure. You can see here, there's a nickel, and you can actually see d orbital. So you, you can really see electron density if you use low temperature and have high quality data. I was, this is a nickel. Um, dimethylglyoxime, and there's an interesting hydrogen bonding arrangement here. So I really wanted to see hydrogen electron density, and it was pretty miraculous. It showed up, those, those globs there. So these are just contour lines. But you know, the more concentrated areas are the, the places of higher electron density. OK, so again, coming back to Patterson, um, the, the Method doesn't need a phase because what you're doing is, is you're squaring the observed uh, structures, structure factor, the observed ones. And you get this equation here. And this makes a new map. See here, you've got f squared, um, which is plotted in u, v, w instead of x, y, z. And the map is a map of vectors. So let me just go to the next slide. I think maybe this makes sense. OK, so Jenny Glusker is a really famous x-ray crystallographer. And I sat in on a lecture that she gave once. And she, she gave this analogy for the Patterson. I thought it was really nice. <clears throat> so you assume that you have guests uh, making introductions to one another. So there's 100 guests. And the number of introductions you have to make is 99 divided by 2. Because if you're introducing me to you, that cuts it in half, right? Me to you and you to me. <laughs> OK, so all the guests have their shoes nailed to the ground. <laughs> and the lengths of the handshakes represent the various interpeople vectors. So just imagine that the people are atoms. And if one person is very tall, somebody with a lot of electrons, and strong, everyone will remember him or her. So it's just, this is just an analogy thinking about the atoms sitting around a structure. And what we're looking at is the vectors between them. Okay? And just what you do is you just take all of those vectors and put their tails at the origin, and you get a map in u, v, w. If you have a heavy atom and you can get the x, y, z, and it's not too difficult, actually, then you can start to solve the structure. It may not all pop out, out at once, but you do get a start on it, and gradually you can solve it. I've done it many times. I can guarantee you it works. It's kind of more of a challenge than running XT. It's kind of fun. My first structure, it took me about three months to do, and it took me, of those three months, probably at least a month to figure out the Patterson map. But it was a very complicated one. The more heavy atoms you have, the more complicated it gets. But let's just um, look at a couple of other things about it. Um, it's centrosymmetric. Again, it's, it's this you know, introduction kind of thing. The vector from B to A is the same as the vector from A to B. So you have centrosymmetry. Um, the symbol for the Patterson uh, symmetry is in the international tables. It's right below the space group symbol. But you take away the uh, translation again. So p21 over c becomes p2 over m. c2 over c becomes c2 over m, and so on. So that's the symmetry of the Patterson map. Okay. If you have space group p1, there's no symmetry in space group p1. So 
a heavy, you can just put your heavy atom anywhere you want and you've faced your structure. It doesn't matter. However, if there's a center of symmetry, then you have to obey that inversion center. So then you have to consider this. This is as complicated as I'm going to take this, but you have, say, an atom at x, y, z. There's also another one at minus x, minus y, minus z, just by inversion. And the vector between them is to take x, y, z minus a minus x minus y minus z, so that gives you 2x, 2y, 2z. And that can be equated to u, v, w on the map. So right away you have solved for x, y, and z for the heavy atom. Make sense? OK. Anyway, once you've done that, then you can put it into your INS file, do a refinement, do a difference map calculation, and start finding the rest of the atoms. And the, the height of the peak that you get in the map is related to the atomic number of that atom. So that's useful, too. The other reason that it's useful is it's item three here. The Patterson map calculation is a quick method to confirm that your structure does or does not contain a heavy atom. So a lot of times, when you can't get a solution right away, it's because you've made an assumption which you shouldn't do uh, too long, you know, you, you got to keep an open mind that there is a heavy atom because that may change the whole process of solving the structure. If there's no heavy atom, it, it's, it's a different story. So even XT, I think, would be, uh, would like it if you take out heavy atoms from your SFAC list if they don't actually occur. But usually it can solve it anyway. What it does, if, there's, if there is a heavy atom and you didn't tell it it has a heavy atom, it assigns it as a bromine. Have you noticed that? Have you ever tried that? <laughs> yeah, it just picks bromine as the sort of typical heavy atom. OK. And if you want to do the computation, it's very easy. This tref command, which is default for direct methods, just change it to pat, P-A-T-T. -T, uh, and then run XS. And it gives you a listing of the peaks, but the listing is in the LST file. It's not in the REST file. So you have to open the LSD file. If there is a heavy atom, the first peak is really big. It has a very large uh, size. So over the years, um, these programs have attempted to make life easier for you. So you didn't have to use either direct methods or TREF. And I tried them all at one time or another. I am simply amazed at how well this program works, though, XT, which has just been out again since for three years. Um, it uses everything we know. It's amazing. And I've never had it fail, actually, given that I have you know, the crystal system right. But if you want to see <coughs> what the, um, besides just saying XT, you can, also, you can also tell the program to constrain it to be one particular space group or one particular crystal system. Um, there's a whole lot of options. So if you merely on the command prompt type XT, it will then list all of the uh, variations that you can do on that. And that's the reference for it. But again, you can go to the website, the ShellX homepage, download it. OK, so re reviewing the structure solution process, you're going to be sequentially adding more atoms to your model. Each time you add a correct atom, your R value should go down. If it's an incorrect addition, it will go up. Um, and gradually, it, it converges to the, the final lowest R value. And nowadays, we usually expect, well, less than 10% on the R value. But less than 5% is not unusual. Um, essentially, what you're doing is you're, you're comparing FOBs and FCALC squared. And or, yeah, or f obs and f-calc, depending on which, how the comparison is being made. There is a scale factor k, which is making them on the, just on the same scale. It's not changing anything except to make them on the same scale. And there is a line in the ins file called fvar. You may have noticed. I'll show it to you again. The first argument in that <coughs> column is the scale factor. And it's a parameter. It's being refined. The R1 value is usually based on only the strong uh, data. 
So f obs greater than four sigma. F obs, that's R1. <coughs> and then usually people re also report WR2 based on all of the data. It's at least twice as large as R1 usually, which is why people prefer to report R1. <laughs> but it's actually the, uh, the refinement is using all the data nowadays, unless you specifically restrict it. The uh, weight is a weighting term that's approximately 1 over the sigma squared. It has a couple more terms, but that's the main thing. And the reason you use the weight is to, as I wrote here, smooth out the standard deviations. And this is the equation for WR2. Uh, sometimes people report it in publications, but sometimes they don't because everybody knows now what that is. I don't think it matters too much if you put it in. So now let's look a little more on the INS file. I think that there's some pointers that some people may be missing. Maybe not. Depends how your experience is. Um, again, because it was originally written in Fortran, the number of uh, spaces allocated to di the different terms varies. Most of the time, every line starts with four characters, either a four-letter word or four characters. So the atom names in the INS file are restricted to four characters. And I've put these two little things here just to show as placeholders that you can take four spaces for the atom name. No more. <laughs> if less than four, then you have to add spaces to make up four. Then you start with the SVAC number. Like if it's carbon and it's the first atom listed in the SVAC line, it's one. Then XYZ. Then SOF stands for site occupation factor. And lastly, in this case, is the isotropic U-value, or thermal parameter. This uh, site occupation factor 11 looks weird, I know, but what it is actually is the occupation is, is 1 if it's fully occupied. And then you add 10 to that to make it fixed. So in other words, this is not a refined parameter. It's fixed. The things that, were, that are variables are x, y, and z, and u. Okay, so in, in describing this atom, uh, there are four variables in the, in the uh, least squares refinement procedure. And what else have I written here? Yeah, usually you write, in the SVAC list here, you would put um, carbon first, hydrogen second, and then other atoms. And U ISO, is, if, if everything is right, usually doesn't go much further than 0.02 to 0.08 angstrom squared. I look a lot at the U values because they tell you a lot. Um, if the atom you have selected is too large, then um, these will get too small. No, am I saying that backwards? Yeah, I'm saying that backwards. Let's say you have um, a carbon and it's actually it's actually an oxygen, but you've put it in as a carbon, then the thermal parameter will be too small. All right. I'll show you an example of, of that, too. So again, let's look at the numbers of parameters. I, this is even a very short list here. If you want to make the um, thermal parameter anisotropic and use that tensor quantity, you're going to go from one to six variables. Um, in the syntax of this program, if you say n is 15, it'll make the next 15 atoms anisotropic. If you just say n is with nothing after it, it makes everything anisotropic except hydrogens. It doesn't do it to hydrogens. Um, if you wanted to make a mercury anisotropic and one chlorine anisotropic, it would just make those two. Or you can say, like HG1 dollar sign CL, it would affect all chlorines. And if you just want to pick a particular range of atoms, you could put anis at the beginning of the range. Everything following that will become anisotropic until it encounters anis zero, and that's where it ends. So then you're going to get these six numbers, U11, U22, U33, 
U2, 3, U1, 3, U1, 2. And you get an ellipsoid. Um, it's giving a, a pretty accurate view of the shape of the electron density. And um, U11, U22, U33 are parallel to the A, B, and C axes if you're in an orthonormal system. So like orthorhombic, tetragonal, cubic. Um, the off-diagonal terms relate the values to the reciprocal axes. Okay, so it's really only real intuitive when it's orthorhombic, <coughs> but we, what you probably will notice is that it is elongated in the direction of, of the libration. So you'll see them, you know, looking like, like this. If you plot them, they look like that. The, um, if you see them, instead of being like that, looking more like this, that's um, an alert, a SIF alert, and it means that there's something wrong with what you're, what you're doing. They should be perpendicular to the bond, like that. This is right, this is wrong. So um, when, you, when you check your structure, there'll be alerts if this is the case. It might mean you just have the wrong atom type. Or maybe it isn't even there. So you have to consider what's happening if you see that. OK, let's go back to the number of parameters idea. <laughs> um, you remember we talked about special positions. So when an atom sits on a special position, its occupancy is no longer full because it's, uh, if it's on a special position, there's only maybe four uh, symmetry operations that apply to that instead of eight, and so on and so forth. You can, you can try it and you'll see. Just take something that's on a special position, apply all the general positions to it, and you'll see that some of them are duplicates. So in this case, let's say the special position is a half, a half, a half. The occupancy is only a half, adding tens to it to fix it. And uh, here we have a thermal parameter. So the only variable in this atom line is the thermal parameter. These are fixed, 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 fixed. This varies. And if it's anisotropic, then you're going to have x, y, z and then the six um, thermal parameter values. So there are nine parameters. Yeah? Clear? OK. All right, so the process is essentially, <laughs> you start out with an INS file, you do a refinement. That spits out a res file and an LST file. The HKL file doesn't change. What is going on here? <laughs> My helper. <laughs> okay, that was just sort of distracting. <laughs> All right. At this stage, you need to examine your structure by using one of the molecular geometry programs like XP or some other one. Maybe delete some atoms that are spurious, add some more atoms that you know are present because they show up at the top of the difference map list. Um, so you make some adjustments to the structure and then take that file and rename it as an INS file, repeat the refinement, and repeat it again in the same way. So it's an iterative process getting to the final solution. Uh, you might want to use Mercury. I like using XP because I'm so used to it, but Mercury also works. There's other programs incorporated. That was the end. Hmm. Okay. I guess that is the end. Let's see. Um, we have a few more minutes. Do you want to see another structure? Or what? Maybe we could go through another uh, 
example. Okay, so I don't, I don't remember what this is, but you can just look at it. Um, so this is a structure. We know that it, for sure it contains carbon, hydrogen, copper, nitrogen, and oxygen. It was collected at 90 K. We can see that it is orthorhombic, right? And Z of one is not realistic, but we don't know. A blue plate that fits with it being copper. So let me just, this isn't set up as a P4P file, so I actually need to know X, Y, and Z. All I need to know are 8.9912. Can you see that? 15.3143. Hmm? 25. Point three five nine two. Okay. So I can remember the rest: carbon, hydrogen, copper. Okay. So let's just go to X prep. So I'm going to go to Michelle. So I have a place to put it. I know. Thing. No, it's okay where it is. Ah, uh, okay, wait. Okay, now I'm in the right directory. <laughs> Make it bigger. Can you see it okay? Do we need to dim the lights again? Can you see it? Yeah, it's okay? Okay. So I'm just going to run xprep. And the uh, file name is mn1112. Um, the, this is asking about the format for the hklf file in its four, and then I need the cell, so 8.9912, 15.3143, and 25.3592. Okay, again, um, it looks like strong data, very nice I over sigma. Mono, it's a primitive. And H only finds an orthorhombic lattice. It didn't change anything. If it did, the matrix would be other than the unitary matrix. S is determine or input space group. Once again, <laughs> uh, it's orthorhombic. Okay, I agree. P, yep. Okay, now based on the systematic absence exceptions, 
we have three glides, and it's PBCA. That's a fairly common space group, actually. It's centrosymmetric. And it didn't, it could have um, applied a matrix transformation, but it didn't. And then display intensity statistics is S. And A is merge all equivalents, including Friedel opposites. That's probably safe to do. It's only copper and it's um, centrosymmetric, so we do that. Oh, okay, this is old data, so it's already merged. <laughs> so the R merges are all zero. But the resolution is 2.68. That's really good resolution. And it's complete to 97.2% to 6.68 resolution. You could cut it so to maybe 0.71 resolution, and then it would be almost 100% complete. So you might want to do that. The, way we, the easy way to do that is go back to here, go to H, apply high, low resolution cutoff. And then I would put in, say, 0.71. Low, low resolution limit is infinity. And to see what that did, I go back to S. And now you see the completeness is 99.9%. So yeah, it looks, it looks good that way. It's, Maybe uh, you're losing some data, but it's more complete. Uh, it's kind of a trade-off. I think probably you didn't really need to cut it, but we did. And then we go to, uh, you see the first w uh, one was more, more data. The second one is less data, but it's more complete. OK, and then E, um, exit to main menu. Now we need to put in the um, expected unit cell contents. So let's just take a wild guess here. The volume's 3492. Uh, PBCA has eight general positions. So that's about um, 400 cubic angstroms per asymmetric unit, which would be about 20 atoms, roughly. So since I don't really know the structure, I'm just going to guess. I'm just going to say C say 16, H20, um, copper, into O2. So it's about, about 20 atoms. <laughs> and you see tentative Z is 8. That's, that's correct for PBCA. Density looks OK. Uh, everything else looks fine. And so now we're just going to output this. And it's asking, well, what program do you want to use to solve the structure? I'm just going to use XT. XM was old. It's really not used anymore. But I'll just put it, make an output like that. Yes. OK. Good. OK, so XT. Did I change the name? No. Structure solution took all of three seconds. <laughs> OK, so it's, it's offering some other choices here, A, B, C, D, E. I think it's probably PBCA, though. The other ones are non-centrosymmetric or chiral. And usually the first one is the one that's best. You can't really distinguish them based on the R1 that's given here and the R weak and all of that. They all look about the same. So let's go with the first one. So I'll try XP on MN112. Is that right? 1112. Underline A. Oh, it's just some simple thing. <laughs> it, 
it actually looks like it identified nitrogens and oxygens and carbons correctly. Now I do encourage you to do numbering. And the way to do numbering in this program is to use something called PIC. And it just, it flashes on the atom that's waiting to be numbered. So I might want to call that C2. And then 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, C8, C3, oops, go back, C3. Um, then that's another ring, so this 9, 10. don't really know if that's carbon or not. Let's just try it. Okay, anyway, I may change my mind about the numbering system, but for the time being, it's pretty good. Then you want to sort them, so you would say sort. But let me just show you the list first. So here's the list as it is now. You see it's not sorted. You see that? So you say, say info, and it's, it shows you all the atoms. And the peak for copper is bigger than all the rest, so that makes sense. Now if I say sort, whoops sort and info. It's sorted, except that it goes O1, N1, C1, O2, N2. So I don't want to do that. I want to have oxygen and then nitrogen and then carbon. So to do that, you would say sort Cu1 dollar sign O dollar sign N. And then it's going to sort by atom type. See that? OK. And file. N1112. One, 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 That's going to write the ins file. And it's going to use the heading from the rest file. And why can't it be opened? <laughs> oh, maybe it doesn't exist yet. No, it should exist. Oh, it's underline A. That's why. Now I've run out of space, so I just have to hit enter and do it again. So let me show you what the ins file looks like now. It's just um, what it was before, except it has added LS10, bond, dollar sign H, list 6, FMAP2, and plan 20. So FMAP2 means calculate a difference map. Plan 20 gives, says give me the top 20 peaks. And then here are all the atoms. <clears throat> and you see this F bar? That's that scale I was telling you about. So this number starts out as 1, but it's going to vary as we do a refinement. It'll do 10 cycles of refinement, the way it's set right now. So I just do XL and then the file name. Zoom, so fast. Less than a second. <laughs> now I want to look at what it did. So it wrote a rest file. Make this bigger. Um, you see, FR has changed. It's 0.28 now. These have all been modified. 
the thermal parameters are here. They look pretty good, the thermal parameters. There's no outlier. They're all kind of in the same ballpark, so we say. So I think those are probably identified correctly, those atoms. Um, the next step would be to go on and add hydrogens, um, make the non-hydrogen atoms anisotropic, um, check it one more time for reasonable bond distances and angles, do some graphics. Mm -hmm. The, the R factor? The what? The weight? Yes. Um, you don't really need to worry about the weight until you're close to the end. But it, it will have an impact, particularly on WR2, smaller impact on R1. Uh, if you use a program like Shell X La, I don't know about OLX2 and WinGX. There's a button you can press and it will update the weight until it's until the input weight equals the output weight and they, they agree with one another. In this case, you see the output weight is here and it's not that close to what it started with. But it's not too far. Uh, but when you're done, they should agree. They should definitely agree. And then let's look at the difference map. The um, Q1 and Q2 are bigger than the size of a hydrogen but that might be just be because they're close to the copper, and the copper is not anisotropic yet. So I'm not too worried about it. And the rest of these are probably hydrogens. There's a sort of a rule of thumb, though. If, you're, if you have Q peaks greater than hydrogen, you should be a little concerned about that. So these are basically the number of electrons, these peak heights here. So peak height around one is hydrogen. Um, Again, I think these are probably just due to kind of some electron density around the coppers because they're big. So, yeah. If you would like, I have a whole catalog of structures to solve if you want practice solving structures. The ones that I have selected are not difficult ones. What you would probably be more interested in though are the ones that are really tricky, but it's also boring as anything to watch somebody solve a, crystal, a tricky crystal structure. So I'm gonna try and make it less boring as much as I can. Uh, but bear with me, because these are the snags that are going to keep you from finishing the crystal structures. And I want you to get to the point where you can do it yourself, not you know, complain a lot. <laughs> All right, I think that's enough for now. I, I think we should take a break, go get a coffee or whatever. And yeah, do try. With those glasses, look up anaglyph. It's, there's some really cool pictures of uh, space things and national parks and all kinds of stuff, and they just really will jump out at you. Hmm? When, we, when do we start doing what? Doing, I'm sorry, I still didn't understand you. What? Do you want to? Yeah. OK, then I need to get them onto the web page. Um, and then I'll put a few up there. OK. Yeah. All right. <laughs>